Welcome to the Brand Doctor Podcast, strategies that help entrepreneurs build reputable and profitable brands. Here's your host, Henry Kaminsky Jr. Valuetainment. What is it? And why do you need it as an entrepreneur in 2019? Okay, guys, you guys have been waiting for this for a while. I finally got him locked down. This man is the creator of Valuetainment on YouTube. As a natural critical thinker, this man takes complex leadership management and entrepreneurial ideas and converts them into simple life lessons for today and tomorrow's entrepreneurs. He's passionate about shaping the next generation of leaders by teaching thought-provoking perspectives on entrepreneurship and disrupting the traditional approach to a career. Without further ado, I want to introduce Patrick Bet David to the show. What's going on, my dude? How you doing? I'm doing awesome, man. I'm doing awesome. Really excited about today's show. I'm happy to have you. I'm, I, I appreciate you, 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 you're carving some time out of your busy, busy day to, to come on and, and chat with me and my audience. So for those folks who don't know who you are, over a million followers on subscribers on, on, on YouTube, and you've, you've created this valuetainment concept. So for those folks that don't know what that is, can you please, can you explain? <laughs> Can you please explain that to the audience? Sure, absolutely. So uh, my background, I was uh, born and raised in Iran. We escaped Iran after living there 10 years, lived at a refugee camp two years, came to the States. I went in the army. I got out of the army, and then I started working on financial services the day before 9-11 with Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter. Then I went to Transamerica, October of 2009. I started my own insurance company with 66 agents, and today we just crossed 10,000 agents in 49 states. De La Hoya is one of my investors. Gabriel Brenner, the owner of Houston Dynamo, is another one, and Adelaide Fund out of New York. And that's what I do professionally, financial services. So in 04, I watched what Ron Paul did on MySpace. Ron Paul was running for office as a 69-year-old man. In 04, he raised $6 million in 24 hours on MySpace. It was a Guinness Book of World Record. All the politicians are like, wait a minute, what just happened right now? <laughs> A 69-year-old man raised $6 million in 24 hours? Yes, he did. So in 04, at the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, a one-term senator when he gave a talk, and he saw what Ron Paul did. He says, wait a minute. If a 69-year-old guy can raise $6 million in 24 hours, he's not a hip, he's not cool, he's not young like me, what can I do? Well, that guy ended up raising $2 billion, became a two-term president, Barack Obama. And then the next person that became a president, he understood social media. And through social media and Twitter, he became president, having never been involved in politics ever before. And he's currently the president today, Donald Trump. So watch this. This is not a political message because Ron Paul was a libertarian, is a libertarian, Obama Democrat, Trump is a Republican. When I watched this year, I said, okay, times are changing. And so in 2013... Uh, we produced our first uh, video on our YouTube channel. It was called Patrick Bay David back then. And for the first two years, I was just messing around producing videos about food and movies and music and what I like, just kind of teasing, seeing how it's going to be. And then a couple of years later, I said, we got to kind of change this thing up. We got to take one word that I feel confident talking a lot about and see what we can do with it. Mm. So I started asking all my peers, I asked my wife, people I work with, I said, if you can think about one word that I know a lot about, that I talk a lot about, what would you say it is? People said, Pat, you either obsessed with capitalism or you're obsessed with entrepreneurship, but it's one of those things. I said, great. And how about we do the word entrepreneur? That's what I'm going to be doing. So we said the word entrepreneur and anything around it is what we're going to create content with. Today, if you go on YouTube, you type in the word entrepreneur, probably 25% of the videos on page one is going to be me. And, and that's algorithm. You can't buy that. YouTube sees this as the top channel for entrepreneurs. And that's what happens. So at that same time, I said, look, I I want to change the channel's name up. I don't want it to just be Patrick Bay David because I want to build a brand. Let's change the name up. We bring value. It's somewhat entertaining. And we are becoming a movement. Why don't we call it Valuetainment? I said, there's no way anybody has this name, Valuetainment. So I went and looked around. There was a publicly traded company in Germany called Valuetainment who owned the domain address, Valuetainment.com. I said, I need this domain. So I sent him a message. I said, man, we got to buy this domain from you. He sent me some ludicrous offer, like a $300,000 number. I said, I'm not paying you. <laughs> so I said, okay, we'll be patient about it. I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to flood the marketplace with so much content with value, Tim, and that he eventually has to give that website to us. <laughs> Fast forward three years later, okay? 
everything online. By the time you tap in on Google, it's us. He keeps going to page two, page three, page four, page five. He changes the company's name to Value Tees and finally sells me the domain. We bought the domain like six months ago from him. And uh, from there on, by the time it went from what it was to now 1.3 million subscribers, over a billion minutes watched. And now when people think about entrepreneurship, they think about value tainment. Oh, my God. What a story, dude. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. So how does one, why does an entrepreneur need to understand and really implement this concept of value payment into their, into their philosophy of business and entrepreneurship in 2019? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's not that they have to. It's a lot of the stuff I share my, um, I, I saw online, there was a lot of people that were creating content that were either profess, professorial, like these were professors from a, hey, I have a degree from Wharton and I'm going to teach you an MBA class online, but I've never ran a business. I've never raised money. I've never really done anything, but I'm a very good teacher and I know a lot and I've read a lot of theories and I'm going to teach it to you. Then I saw some people that were creating content who watched somebody else do it. For example, Guy Kawasaki used to be very hot because he was a, a, a what was he called? Chief evangelism, uh, 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 chief evangelist officer at Apple years ago with Steve Jobs. So he created content on what it was like to run with a Steve Jobs. And people said, oh, wow, this is amazing. Not only does he have some ideas and opinions, but he also watched somebody else do it. So I sat there and I said, what kind of people do I like to take a lot of counsel from myself? Like, who do I gravitate towards? I started noticing the people that I would sit down with and I would be si- it would be silence because I was listening to everything they were saying. They had three things in common. They had their own theories. Okay. They had experiences that they watched other people do, but they also did it themselves. And I called them a trifecta. And a trifecta's level of credibility is a different level. You see a lot of onlineers talking about affiliate marketing. You start your own course, start your own this, start your own that. I don't want to be that. We've never sold a course. We're probably going to sell a course. I've been saying three years I want to sell a course. I still haven't sold a course. But at this point, I made a commitment at the event that I'm going to sell a sales course. I'm going to come up with that. We're probably going to do a public speaking course. We're probably going to do some raising money course. And it may be in the next three, four years. But I said, I'm just going to start creating content. And so it was through experiences Here's how I raised $10 million from these guys. And when you're negotiating and you're going through with De La Hoya or Gabriel Brenner or a big fund, this is what they're looking for. This is term sheet. This is what you go through when you first come out with the numbers. You don't want to oversell yourself because then you're going to have to give more equity. And here's what happens if you take too much money up front or you stay a little bit patient and use your own money. And this is what happens if you team up with a business partner that may have a strong personality like yours. It could end up being a division. It's better off if you set it up like this and you use the right attorneys. So I just kind of started saying the stuff that is experienced, not just because I read all these books behind me and then people started gravitating towards it and saying, look, I kind of like this concept. So I think that's what people started seeing a different point of view on value Tim and that was different than a lot of the other stuff you saw on YouTube. So that's why we gravitate and we pull a lot of our audience from YouTube and come and say, I kind of like the way this guy thinks. Well, there's a couple of things that you do that I, I really enjoy and, and I respect is that you, you tell it to your audience straight and there's, there's really no nonsense about it. It's you get straight to the point and you knock it out of the park and you move on to the next thing. Cause I, I've, I've done, I've, I've consumed quite a bit of your content over the weekend and over the past couple of weeks, knowing that you were coming on the show. And I got to tell you, there was a, there was one video out there and you were talking about 10 questions you need to ask a consultant before you hire them. And so what did I do? I grabbed those 10 questions. I answered them and created an FAQ section on my website. (laughs) Get out of here. (laughs) It's going up tomorrow. I love it. Okay. It's going up tomorrow because I said to myself, he's got some really great questions. And you know what? They weren't stumpers for me because I've been doing this for 13 years, but it would certainly stump somebody that is five, six years, perhaps in the game, doesn't know much about sales could use some more improvement there. So, you know, my next question is, what, were, what was one of the biggest failures that you had to overcome? So early on, I'll give you a big one. When we uh, uh, started uh, our insurance company, within four weeks of starting it, I got sued by a $400 billion company. Mm. And I, I've been sued one, one time in my life, and it was these guys. It was a $400 billion lawsuit. 
for trade secrets and the fact that they were worried I was going to take my 7,000 clients away from them. Oh my God. We didn't take a single client. I didn't take, I didn't go and say, Hey, come, I'm going to sell you here and cancel your policy. We didn't do it. So eight months later, I settled. But during that period of going through it, the entire insurance industry carriers were worried about doing business with us because we had a pending lawsuit. Mm. And every day, I mean, I, I remember one time I came home and we're trying to make it work and we're trying to have a, have a baby at the same time. And my wife is at the house in bed crying because she had a miscarriage and it's just everything's going wrong. We depleted our funds. My entire life savings is down to $13,000. And I'm sitting there saying, you know, you worked in your 20s to save nearly seven, dollars $800,000 and now you're down to $13,000. You put it all in the business within a year. And what's going to happen now? There's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, and, and, and I, never, I never forget that. But, you know, the part about all of these things with failures is the following. You know how in football they have a week they call hell week? You know hell week. You've heard of hell week. Yes. Business has its own hell year. Sometimes it's a hell two, three years, okay? And a big part of your hell year or hell two, three years you go through, it's a test to see if you can handle hell week or hell year or hell two, three years. And that test, That lasts about two to three years. Most people fail the test and they go bad because it's not easy. It's not easy at all. During that test, I got to tell you, this this creative mind of mine, my brain went everywhere. Mm -hmm. What about this? What happens if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? And a lot of it was a lot of fear until one day I just, you know, I just sat there and said, listen, you can sue us. You can do whatever you want to do. There's one thing you cannot do to us. You cannot stop us from working. And my entire life, I've known one thing. I just had lunch with a couple right now that are going through some challenges in their business. And I told them, I said, look, I can lose everything. They can take everything away from you, if, away from you. They cannot take away what I have in here. They cannot take away this. They cannot take away my work ethic. You send me anywhere in the world. I'm going to end up being at the top again because I have that in place. So confidence came from knowing, well, Pat, guess what? If you lose everything, you're definitely not afraid of hard work. You got a lot of experience and strategies in your mind that's worked for you. You don't have to worry about anything. So just get to work. And I put my head down. We got to work. And obviously, the rest is history. <laughs> that sounds very, very familiar, my friend. I, I, we call it cycling. So, you know, you, you cycle, you know, you try not to cycle more than three times. But I was up and I lost it five years in, built it back up, had my firstborn. Lost it again, and I rebuilt over the past 18 months, and I said, never again, baby. I'm going, this is it. There's, there's too much to ride. You know, I, the last thing, I always tell people this. My biggest fear in, in life is to, for my son, Dante, to be old enough to Google my name and him be disappointed at what shows up. And so people ask me, like, why do you do this? Why do you do what you do all the time? Like, what makes you get up every morning? And I go, that fear right there, that fear. And I say, because of that, my clients will benefit. And so, you know, it was funny. My wife and I didn't want kids when we first got married. That was one of our things. We, we talked about it prior to getting married. And I said, no, nah, I, I think we like our lives the way we, you know, the way that, the way it is. And everything changed when this little man walked into our lives. And I, I thought I was driven and motivated and fired up before. <laughs> Bro, it's on a whole different level. And it, it's just amazing what they do to you. And no, no disrespect to my wife I mean, and, and my father, but man, this little guy has got me going. And so that, that's what really drives me. So my question for you is, Ex-military, thank you again for your service. Where did that drive come from? Was it that, was it that uh, the immigrant mentality that Gary Vee always talks about? Or is it, where did this come from? Yeah, so, it, you know, it's a few different things. I mean, I was the guy uh, that in high school had a 1.8 GPA. In Army, I was the guy you wanted to party with. If you went to party with me, you would have had the time of your life with a lot of great <laughs> memories. I, I, I helped everybody that partied with me. I was pretty good at it. <laughs> and uh, when I got out of the military and I came to L.A., I partied still hardcore. And then at 23 years old, I uh, got a call from my sister. My dad had a massive heart attack. I went to the hospital, UCLA Medical Center. I sat my dad. I watched my dad in bed 
they were just mistreating my dad because it was a government type of a facility. Mm. And I lost it. I lost my cool and the cops came and they kicked me out of the hospital and I went in the car and I sat in the car that night. I cried uh, like a little baby for 30 minutes. And I said, here you are partying six, seven nights a week and your dad's about to die. And he's stressed out because of money. And you are just all about the women and the party. And this is all you're doing. This is it. What a way to live. Good for you, guy. I mean, your parents sacrificed everything to bring you to America. This is not where they speak their language. English is their fifth language. And you're just being so selfish about it. Mm-hmm. Phenomenal job, kid. And uh, I said, it's game over. The next day I came to work uh, in the office. And you wouldn't recognize me from the day before to the following day. I was working 100 hours a week. And I can't think of the last time I stopped. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just went at it. And I told my dad, I said, you know, the world is going to know our last name. I just want you to know this. The world is going to know this, by David, last name. They're going to know who you were and what you did. And the sacrifices you made. So, you know, part of it was life experiences. And the other part was when I sat down and I read a book one time by this British diplomat called Leaderless Revolution. And in the book, I don't remember a lot about that book, but there's three things that he said in the book. He said, anybody that takes a business or an idea and makes a revolution out of it, something very big that it's just everybody looks at and says, how the hell did this happen? There's three things that drives them. They either know what they love, they know what they hate, or they know what bothers them. Everybody has one of these three. Typically, what motivates the most people, uh, what, what motivates most people to perform at the highest level is what they hate, believe it or not. Because the whole saying goes, whatever you don't hate, you'll learn to tolerate. You just talk about right now saying, I fear the day that my son goes and Googles daddy's name and you know he's going to be disappointed with who father is. That's driven by fear, right? This is driven by the fact that you hate the fact that your parents weren't treated properly, or you hate the fact that, you know, when you walked in, when your dad walked into a room, people didn't have that respect, or you hate the fact that, you know, you don't earn a certain level of respect, or you don't have the lifestyle. Something's got to be the juice there. For me, I grew up in a very, uh, you know, rough family. My mother said they were all communists. My dad said they were all imperialists, and I lived in Iran. We got bombed 167 times in a single day. It's not the most peaceful place. A lot of anxiety, a lot of panic, a lot of worry. A lot of concerns. You don't know what's going to happen the next day. I mean, six weeks after Khomeini died, we escaped. So it's a very, lots of turmoil. Mm. So when we came here, for me was, if you're telling me in America, I have the freedom to go out there and build a business as big as I want, work as hard as I want, and you cannot control me, and I can compete in the marketplace, we're going to make it happen. The rest was history. So the drive and ambition is a lot of a deep feeling and emotions of my upbringing and a few experiences I had in my uh, mid-20s late twenties that I said, this is not going to ever happen again. Oh man, man, dude, I could sit here and talk to you for hours about this stuff. You know, I, I, I respect your time and I got to wrap this show up, but let I, I do want to get into, I do want to get into the, the, the doc's prescription and really point out a few things. You know, one thing that really, really impresses me about you, Pat, and don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass either is, you, you have a level of certainty about you that is extremely attractive, right? And those folks out there that, you know, go into business with this wishy-washy mentality or this lack of confidence or perhaps sometimes a little bit too much overconfidence where they don't think they need the help, right? I want you to check that. And I really want you to pay attention to the level of certainty that you are delivering because that's what people are buying. People are buying your confidence and they're, they're, they're buying your ability to help them get to where they want to be. There's another thing that you mentioned before that I really want to pay attention to is I don't hear enough people talking about being a practitioner and actually experiencing the things that you are quote unquote teaching or an expert on or a guru at there's every time I turn on the computer, there's another guru that's popping up in my feed with a sponsored ad. I like the fact that you determine whether or not you're going to work with somebody or whether or not you're going to listen to them based upon the experience that they are creating for themselves or had gone through in the past to, to make them the expert or make them the authority that they are. I really want you folks that are watching and listening to this. If you didn't put in the 10,000 hours, if you didn't, if you didn't, if you're trying to teach something that you don't have any love for, or you just want to do it to make a quick buck, I want you to check that because I don't think you're going to see there's a difference between you and Pat. 
the, the man just sat here for 25 minutes and, and talked with passion. You can hear it in his voice. I can see him. Some of you guys that are watching the podcast can only hear him, but I'm sure you can hear that conviction in his voice. That to me is a stand up dude. And so I, I really want you guys to pay attention. If you guys want to be an influence in your marketplace, if you want to dominate and really make something of yourselves, then these are the characteristics. I highly, highly encourage you to go over to Value Tainment on YouTube and just consume some of the videos. I like them because they're short and sweet and they're punchy. There's not a lot of bullshit, excuse my language. You know, I was listening to a podcast yesterday. I was waiting for him to get to the goddamn point. It was 60 minutes. And finally, the last 10 minutes, he gives us 10 minutes about how to leverage LinkedIn. And that drove me crazy because I was like, that's 60 minutes of my time. I'm trying to give you the benefit of the doubt here. And that's what you give me, 10 minutes? I'm like, come on. So I, I love the fact that you keep it short, you keep it sweet, you keep it punchy, and you're entertaining. And, and, and those are some things that I, I, I truly, I hope, I hope people have told you that in the past because, you know, people, I don't think people give other people enough credit and highlight their superpowers enough. And I think when, you, when, when people tell that about you, about me, and, and why they, they follow people, pay attention because you have it in you as well. But sometimes you just may need somebody like Pat or myself or somebody to point that out. So with all that said and done, let's get into the question of the day. The question is, what's the biggest mistake you can make when it comes to scaling your business? And I'll, I'll take a stab at it and then I'm going to throw it over to Pat. <clears throat> the biggest mistake that I made when I was scaling my business from a one-man band to a 13-man team is thinking that I could do everything on my own and that I was never going to find team members that were going to do it better than me. I forget what, I forget his name, but they talk about this called expert or hero syndrome or whatever the hell it's called, where you think that you're never going to find somebody better at, or as good as you. And that is the biggest mistake. That is the biggest glass ceiling you can create for yourself. Pat talks about it in his videos, but investing in people and, and, and paying these folks a little bit extra perhaps and investing the time and energy to, to building these people up, I think is the definitely a, 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 a vision to have, especially if you want to get past the glass ceiling of, of revenues that you're, that you're hitting right now because you're not going to be able to do it on your own. Pat? I think that was a great explanation you just gave. What I would add to that is, you know, first things first is too many times when it comes down to scaling, people really don't know what kind of a business they want to build. Let me explain what I mean by this. I sat with a guy and a guy says, you know, I, I just want to build a one-man office selling real estate and insurance. Great. It's, it's, he knows his vision. He's not trying to take over the world. He knows his vision. And then I met another guy when I first got started. We went to a sushi spot in Palm, uh, Pasadena. And I said, so what's your vision? He said, we want to be the, uh, one of the most reputable financial services companies in the Southern California marketplace. And then he asked me, and he says, what are you guys trying to do? I said, we're trying to have a half a million licensed agents nationwide and become the largest financial marketing organization ever. Now, that sounds arrogant when you only have 66, and it sounds cocky. I've been saying this since July of 09. If you talk to anybody that's been around me, will tell you Pat's been saying this since July of 09. So then you sit there, and if the guy that just wants to run one office becomes envious and jealous of our vision, or if the guy that wants to be the biggest and so is annoyed with it, he shouldn't be. Because it's not about how big somebody else wants to build it. It's about who you're trying to be and what kind of a business you want to build. I had a person one time called me and they, they, they had another person they were going up against and this other guy kept out producing them, out producing them, out producing them. And one day she called me and she was just furious and said, I'm sick and tired of not trying to do as good as this guy is. I'm so sick of it. I said, let's, let's take a quick time out. I said, do me a favor. I said, what kind of a life you want to live? I said, give me an ideal life. Well, what do you mean? I said, what kind of a life do you want to live? Pat, if we just have a house, that's 3,000 square feet, okay? It's four bedrooms, five bedrooms, in a decent neighborhood. doesn't have to be gated, close to a good private community. I can send my two kids to a good private school. My husband and I can have a decent life. I'm happy. I don't need to drive a Ferrari or a Lambo, 
but I would like to drive a decent Mercedes. I said, what do you need to make to have that life? She said, if I make one fifty to $200,000 a year, I'm very happy. I can live that life. I said, this guy's trying to make $10 million a year. Why are you comparing yourself to him? <laughs> if he's trying to make $10 million, you're not going to work like him. He needs to do a whole different thing to make $10 million a year net profits. You're not trying to make $10 million net profits. You're trying to make $200,000 a year net profits. Stop comparing yourself to anybody else. So number one is knowing what kind of a business you want to build and who you want to be, how big it is. And then get the specific mathematical formula that helps you get there the fastest. Very simple. Let me explain. X times Y equals, you know, whatever you're trying to get to. So if you're trying to get to a quarter million dollar year income, a million dollar year income, $10 million year income, $100 million year income, another person may do it faster than you because they have a better formula than you. So what do I mean by this? This number is a behavior times this number of times times this number of hours times this number of people working for you equals this much money. And if you follow this formula, you're going to be able to get to where you want to get to within six and a half years. Whoever has the better formula that drives it is going to get there sooner. So yes, all the stuff that we talk about people, 100, I would put what he said as number one. What I'm saying to you is your formula, who you want to be, and what's the formula that's going to help you get there the fastest. Once you figure out that formula with the manpower clients, where your clients are, who they are, where they hang out with, how do you get them? What kind of people do you need? Who do you need to hire first? Once you have that formula, you drive that, you'll be there in no time, no matter how big your vision is. It may be six months for somebody that the vision is bigger, maybe five years or 10 years or 20 years. But as long as you have the right formula and you drive it, things will fall in its place. I love it. I love it. I love it. And that makes sense because here's the thing. I think what most of us forget to do is to actually write that out up front. (laughs) We're so quick to jump into the tactics that we forget that, oh, wait, we need a game plan. (laughs) <laughs> before we jump in and start doing all the sexy stuff. Oh, true. So, you know, I love it. Pat, thank you so much, my friend. Listen, where can people, wh- what do you got going on these days? Is, is there anything that we should be telling our audience to check out? I mean, I have a, I have an event that I have that's just sold out. We sold 10,301 tickets. My keynote speakers will be Billy Bean, Jordan Peterson, Kobe Bryant, and President Bush. It'll be in Mirage, but that, that event's already done with. I just did an event for uh, 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 value tainers for entrepreneurs and executives around the world. We have people there from 43 different countries in Dallas, and it was called the Vault Conference 2019. We'll do a Vault Conference 2020, and uh, which which uh, will announce the details of that. But you got to stay tuned for that conference. So it'll be me mainly teaching over three and a half, four days, and I'll typically bring three or four or five speakers to talk about specific topics. This last time I brought. Netflix, former chief tel- talent officer. I brought Peter Guber, owner of the Golden State Warriors. I brought Phil Heath, seven-time Astro Olympia. I brought the highest paid mobster of all time and a couple other guys. But if you follow me on Bayou Tammy, you'll kind of get some of the updates. If somebody wanted to send a message to me, the only places where I personally respond back is Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And LinkedIn, I'm the slowest. So if you send me a message on LinkedIn, you're going to get a response, but it may take a couple of weeks, may take a month. But Instagram, I'm generally the quickest and you can just find me at Patrick Ben David. I love it. I love it. I love it. There you have it, guys. I hope you got some value out of today's conversation with my man, Pat. Pat, thanks again for carving time out of your day and, and speaking with my audience and, and dropping those jewels, man. That was awesome. Appreciate you for having me. You got it. So guys, real quick, before I forget, like, subscribe, drop a comment. If you're on iTunes, hit those reviews, drop me a few, four or five lines. Let me know what you like, what you dislike about the podcast. I love that feedback. It's the fuel that drives this program. Thank you so much. Last but not least, guys, the monthly coaching program is now open for enrollment. You can check the show notes. You can check the description on iTunes and enroll into that group coaching program. I am only taking 10 people for this program because I like to keep it tight and intimate. So go check out the details via that link. Have an amazing day, guys, and I will catch you on the next one real soon. Take care. You've been listening to the Brand Doctor Podcast with Henry Kaminsky Jr. To get your appointment with the doctor, visit Brand Audit at www.uniquedesigns.net.